the last few classes, we've been exploring really how to open ourselves both to people that we might write off or judge or push out of our hearts and also to our own life within us. And tonight I want to go right to the, what I consider the ground level, which is all, our entire capacity to have um, that openness to life comes from being able to be open to the experience of sensations in our body. All of the reactivity we have, any aversion we might experience, any disgust or fear or dislike or whatever it is towards ourself or towards the world is experienced in the most basic way as difficult, unpleasant sensations. So, it's not until we have the capacity to let go of our resistance to being right here in these bodies that we actually can come into the presence that includes the world. That's our theme. And I'd like to maybe begin our theme with um, a story some of you might remember for a few years ago. It's one of my favorites. It's a Scandinavian tale about Princess R and the serpent. And the princess's parents had fallen on some pretty difficult times. Uh, they were out of, out of cash, basically. So they had to turn to the dragon to see if maybe they could get a loan from the dragon's hoard. And the dragon said, why certainly, uh, just for one small thing, you know, in exchange, uh, I'd like to marry your daughter. <laughs> and they, you know, they felt terrible about it, but you know, they knew they had to do it. So they, they went to the princess and said, dear, we've decided on um, the proper betrothal for you and you're gonna be married <clears throat> to the dragon. <laughs> And of course she was a resourceful young woman and although she was frightened and upset, she knew to turn to a very wise woman that lived on the edge of town with her, you know, 15 children and 45 grandchildren and the like. And so she went and, and talked to this woman and poured out her story. And the, the wise woman first asked, well, do you want to marry the dragon? She said, absolutely not. And um, she said, and then the wise woman said, well, I have a way, I think you can do it that will help you to feel safe. And she whispered in her ear for a while. And uh, one of the, the first things that she had to do was to get a number of wedding gowns, 10 in fact. So, um, so the wedding day came and all the people came to court and it was a difficult day, of course, big celebration and tough for her, but then they retired to the bridal chambers and the, the dragon turned to the princess and said, well, dear, isn't it time to consummate our wedding? And, uh, and the princess responded, yes, my dear husband, but for me to do so, I must remove my wedding gowns. Isn't that so? And he said, absolutely, my dear, joyfully. And so she said, well, then I have one small favor to ask of you in return. And uh, she said, since I must remove my gowns to be pleasing to you, would you not remove a layer of your own to be pleasing to me? So she took off her wedding gown and he had a few decorative things on his dragon body. He took them off. Okay, fine. So, but to his surprise, he noticed that she had another wedding gown on, the second of 10. Right? So uh, she took that one off, and then the dragons are used to taking off their scales, of course, so like, because, you know, reptiles have to shed now and then. So he peeled off a thin layer and said, well, yes, dear, and oops, she had another gown. <laughs> so as she took off each layer of wedding gowns, four, five, six, the dragon's claws had to dig deeper and deeper into his own flesh and skin to peel off yet another layer. And on the eighth wedding gown she took off, the dragon was down to taking off parts of him that were stuck. And his form began to change. And on the ninth, it changed more remarkably. And when she took off the tenth gown, and by this time, the dragon had pulled off so much dragonness that what was left, as happens in these stories, was 
you guys are tuned in. <laughs> a handsome prince. Yeah. And then she took the advice of the old woman from far beyond the marketplace that had all those dozens of children and grandchildren and had a very blissful wedding night. Okay. So that's our story. <laughs> um, and what we find with the practice of meditation is that we feel the layers of our being opening. Uh, hour by hour as we do, we, what becomes revealed is an underlying beauty, an aliveness, and a spaciousness. Uh, it's really a nobility of being. It's your own Buddha nature, your true nature. And so it, this, this is really the path we're on, which is a letting go of these scales or layers that really are our resistance to what is. Uh, and that's really what we're exploring tonight is the ways we resist coming into our body and how to let go of that and not, not all at once because we, you know, we have our own organic timing but to take off the scales, all the resistances, and, and come into that aliveness in a very full way. So, um, the ground level of defense, as, as we know, uh, against, against uh, releasing the armor is our thinking, so we wake up out of thoughts and come back again and again. And what we discover, and I hope you felt it a bit with the guided meditation, is that while it can be difficult at first, as we really begin to find our presence in this body, where really the presence goes deeper than sensation, we really discover a very subtle energy and aliveness that's very pure. The body really is a portal of awakening to everything that we cherish. You know, I think that we sometimes move through life disappointed because we know about love, but it's often abstract. And to get the felt sense of love, to really inhabit it, we have to be awake in our bodies. And I think we get disappointed, we hear about compassion and we, we feel it some, but it's more abstract. And to have that be alive, we have to be in our bodies. And it's the same with creativity. There's a certain amount of thinking, but there's an energy that we need to be in touch with. Wisdom. Yeah, there's some thinking, but really there's a knowing that's very embodied. A grokking of what's true. And I think we intuit that and feel, a, and kind of sense that we're not all there because we're not all here. The words of Kabir. Inside this clay jug, there are canyons and pine mountains, and the maker of canyons and pine mountains. The God whom I love is inside. So in the early Theravada text, this is uh, Buddhism, a very simple and powerful way it's put is that the ultimate spiritual realization is described this way. It says, described as touching enlightenment with the body. So it's not just a technique. When we talk about mindfulness coming into the first foundation, that's the way it's described of being awake in this body. It's not just a, you know, an on your way technique. This awakeness in the body reveals everything. So we'll explore this and, and I think it's particularly important because often meditation has been misunderstood as a way of transcending the body. We're trying to get out of this earthly realm and into some heavenly realm and where there's dazzling crystal lights and rainbows and so on. And you know, blissful, light-filled spaces. And um, what we discover is this shift that helps us realize that the sacredness that we yearn for is discovered through coming home to what's right here. So 
so I, I love the way John O'Donohue describes this. He says, we need to come home to the temple of our senses. Okay. And he, he puts it this way. He says, our bodies know that they belong you know, to life, to spirit. Our bodies know that they belong. It is our minds that make our lives so homeless. Isn't that good? Yeah. Our bodies know they belong. The body is always in the present. Now that's not saying it feels good. Our presence with our body has to include all the different ways it feels. Our bodies know they belong though to aliveness, to spirit. It's our minds that make our lives so homeless. Now this isn't a diatribe against thinking. I mean, when we're mindful, then thoughts are the most amazing servant of creativity. They guide us on the spiritual path. They help us make life better for many people. They allow us to communicate. So this isn't down on thoughts. It means not to be lost on thoughts and leave our bodies behind. Okay, so the pathway we explore, and we're just going to keep coming back to this again and again, because really the teaching's simple, it's hard but simple, is to wake up out of the trance of thinking and come right here. And you might just try it now. Just close your eyes for a moment and just let the sound of the gong be an invitation right back here again. Just being receptive to the aliveness of our being and sensing the mystery that's inside that, the not knowing. So the challenge is that instead of presence, we're, we're in a trance often and we're on our way somewhere else. You know, again, I'll, I'll read from John O'Donohue, a wonderful poet, teacher, who passed away about five years ago. He says, we rush through our days in such stress and intensity as if we were here to stay and the serious project of the world depended on us. Okay, you can open your eyes if you'd like. I'm seeing a lot of people with closed eyes. It's fine if you want to, yeah. And isn't it true? I mean, we, we have a universe in mind that's kind of, we're right at the center of it and our, we're important, our life's important and we're really serious about it. It's that thousand serious moves I've talked about, that suffaces phrase. So the mental armoring, these are the scales that keep us disembodied. These are when we're lost in thought. That's what's between us and this aliveness. And I like to talk about the flags that can help us to realize, oh, in a trance, come back, come back. And one of the major flags is speeding around when you just sense, oh, this busyness that we're in, this on my way, having to get things done, this map of life, trying to get somewhere and cross things off the list is one of the flags. You know, where are we going to? I think sometimes I, I ta I've been talking about my dog Katie a bunch because she's really teaching me stuff. And one of the things I notice is how she, we go out for a walk and she's constantly, she's this low thing that's like tugging and aiming and barreling forward. And you know, one, I ran into one person that was kind of, we were joking how dogs go on walks to get their pee mail, you know, they're sniffing around and so on. But she's barreling along. And I sometimes wonder like, what, she's such in a rush to get to the end of the walk, you know? But we're like that 
course, for her, she's having a blast, and she has a blast when we're done with the walk. So she's not losing herself so much, but we're so busy and intent on getting somewhere. Okay, that's one of the flags. Then, of course, another flag is getting caught in judgment. Um, that keeps us disembodied. And how, you know, we have this mental assessing machine going on all the time. It's kind of this motor in our brain that's just humming around, just always monitoring, how am I doing? Is there a problem? What do I have to deal with? Are things okay? You know, and often its focus is negative. Yes, there's a problem and you're the problem or I'm the problem. That's just very common. This is the negative bias of the brain. So that's another one, that when we're in it, when somebody's letting us down or when we're on our own case, we're disembodied. Flags. Then, of course, the more subtle flag is this story we're always running about our life. And, of course, we're the protagonist in it. And there's a sense of this self as, as the doer that we, we have this story that we're the doer, or we're the controller, and then sometimes it flips, and instead of being the doer or the controller, we're the victim. But we, we, we have this story about ourselves that we're constantly running, and we're in that story we're not inhabiting. Story of a, a man, Jim, 50 years old, he runs into one of those midlife crises where he feels like he's paunchy and he's lost his edge and his life isn't going anywhere. So he decides to take things under control and he gets a fast, sporty car and he goes on a diet and he exercises so he loses weight and he builds up his muscles and goes to sunrooms and, you, you know, he's just trying to get, get it together here. He buys some new vests that look good on him, goes to a barbershop finally, gets a haircut, he's walking out of the barbershop, he gets hit by a truck, he dies, he gets killed, he goes to God, God, how could you do this to me? And God's response, well, to tell you the truth, Jim, I didn't recognize you. you know? <laughs> so we get caught, shift into the, from the controller to the victim. In the moments of speeding around, on our way, in the moments of judging, in the moments of being inside our stories, those are the moments that we're disconnected from our moment-to-moment -moment experience. We're not living in our body and we're the way John O'Donohue described it, we're homeless. We're not perceiving our belonging to life, to spirit. So, just to say what the causes are behind this disconnecting that we go through, um, Part of it is, is, is intrinsic to survival mechanisms, as we know, that the body secrete opiates to numb us out when there's too much pain. It's nature's way of protecting us. That when there's trauma or too much fear when we're young, there's mechanisms that go into place to help us dissociate because we cannot handle the intensity of the emotions that are flowing through our bodies. So this is part of survival. Um, but as we know, it gets very amplified by our culture. So it's not just with the um, really big physical pain or emotional pain that we um, exit town and we go off into our thoughts and get busy. Um, we really don't have much toleration for discomfort. So in a cultural way, um, if you look at how we relate to nature, that gives you an idea of how we relate to our bodies how much the West has got the idea of nature being this other thing out there that we're going to dominate and make use of and, and suck as much out of as we can. We, we're, it's dominating. It's like we are separate from nature, but we're going to control it. And, make sure, and we're going to try to make sure not too much bad stuff happens to it while we try to get the good stuff. Think of how we're relating to our bodies. We don't trust the body. The body feels like a dangerous place because there's unpleasantness and intensity and pain and feelings. In the same way we don't trust, you know, the world around us. So pain's not natural, it's considered a problem. 
It's a problem to solve with a lot of medication usually. In the same way emotions, grief is supposed to have a timetable. Our fear feels like it's my fear and it's ugly, you know, even though every human and every organism is wired with fear. So we make something wrong out of this naturalness that's right here in our culture. What do we do with aging as a culture? Everything possible to avoid it, <laughs> at least the appearances of it. It's amazing. It's considered as this, in the most mild sense, as an imposition and in the major sense as an insult, and especially to women who show it. We all are doing it, and yet we're doing everything we can, most of us in this culture, to in some way try to um, ignore it or um, fix it. We fight it. And then getting sick and dying, it's kind of like an embarrassment. It's considered wrong. Does that make sense? Is this resonating? Okay. Alan Watts writes about the guy who's winding his watch on the ways to the gallows, you know. Isn't that way? I don't want to think about it, you know. We dress up our corpses as if they're going to a party. Isn't it true? So it's, it's very, uh, you know, we anesthetize births and um, we interfere with the dying process. It's, we're a culture who's not comfortable with the natural cycles. It's the best I can say. And we take refuge in the mind. You know, we, that's, our, that's our place where we feel more comfortable, so we worship the rational mind. We're addicted to thinking, to figuring things out. So a lot of the time that's what we're doing. Rather than opening to the aliveness right here, we're trying to figure something out. We even do it with spirituality. I mean, there's that line, Zen, and reading all the books about Zen, you know. It's something like seeking in some way this coherent understanding. Like we want coherence. We want things to be familiar. So we're always trying to figure things out. And I can speak for myself. I'll sometimes be having a meditation where I'm just really inhabiting the aliveness. And then I realize I've gone into the thoughts that are trying to make sense about reality. Oh, so this means that reality is like this. We want to get a handle on things to control them. That's it. We look for coherence because it gives us a sense we can control our life. One story about a really beloved rabbi, Rabbi Schechter, he's on his deathbed and people are surrounding him and they're waiting for his final words to them. Because final words might let us know, here's what it's all about, you know. And he says in a faltering voice, life is like a fountain. And so it's right around him, circled right around him, pass the word out, you know, through, there's crowds and crowds of people pass the, pass the word out through the crowds and the word goes down a long line of people in the hall and down this twisting staircase, they're whispering it, it's like a fountain, it's like a fountain, it's like a fountain, you know. And then out through the crowds and, and it spreads and spreads, so everybody's going, life is like a fountain. And then finally it gets to this little boy who's uh, like right at the, the edge of the edge of it and, and he's uh, the edge of the crowds and goes, Well, what does that mean? And they're going, Well, not sure. We should ask the right so the question goes up, what does that mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? You know, goes up the stairwell and up through the line and so on. Till finally those it goes through those circling around the rabbi to his closest assistant and he whispers the question into the rabbi's ear. And the rabbi responds so maybe it's not a fountain. <laughs> we don't know, you know, it's like, it's such a mystery. We, we, we talk about love or we talk about this universe or we talk about, you know, how it all, how, what it all's about. We don't know. We move through this life as if we know what we're doing. It, it <laughs> so we spend a lot of time trying to figure it out and get a comfortable handle because entering into our body is entering into this uncontrollable zone, this sphere where it's just all happening. 
and everything happens, including the most intense weather systems. You know, it's all, it can be very violent in there, it can be very peaceful, deliciously pleasant, anguishingly unpleasant. We're out of control, and we don't like that. <laughs> Can't control that either. <laughs> So it brings me to technology, our toll on children. I mean, our children are just like hooked into a cyber field, right? They are, you know, video games and so on, less and less in the body, less and less in nature. And of course we see it with, you know, obesity and so on. It just, it's just like not staying in contact with the natural rhythms. So one teacher, you know, described interviewing children about the importance of the body, and one child said it's meant to carry the head around, you know. <laughs> Another story, a boy's sharing, this little boy, I think, you know, like in kindergarten, he announces that his cat had kittens, and, and, you know, they were saying, well, what sex? And he said, oh, there were three females and three males, and the teacher said, well, how do you know? He said, well, my daddy picked them up and turned them over. It must be ridden on their bottoms, you know. <laughs> This disconnection. So. so another cultural conditioning is that there's a mistrust of pleasure. You know, that we, and this is very um, much from uh, religious traditions, including some interpretations of Buddhism, of being wary of the body, being wary of the seduction of the senses. This idea that the physical world is less worthy that sacredness is when we transcend, as I was mentioning earlier. I remember hearing in the early days of the Insight Meditation Society, this is in uh, Massachusetts, they had a three-month retreat and they, it was led by a, a Burmese teacher, a Burmese Buddhist teacher in his seven, and this, was, this took place in the 70s, just to give you a setting. And during the retreat, this Burmese teacher um, was uh, asked about sex. And his response, sex is base, gross, and disgusting. Okay, this is the 70s, remember this, okay? They're at this retreat in the 70s. Well, afterwards, as a way of integrating and so on, some of the students were doing some skits. And in one of the skits, they had one of them playing this, you know, Burmese teacher, and another was the student saying, uh, Sayadaw, can you please describe, uh, tell us something about sex? And Sayadaw said, sex is basic, engrossing, and worth discussing. <laughs> So we're talking about really a body-mind split that's perpetuated by the culture. It's amplified by emotional wounding, as I mentioned at the very beginning. The more wounding there is, the more our nervous system has, you know, the strategies to dissociate so we don't have to feel what's there. So if we look closer and say, well, what are the core principles here? What we find out is that in this embodied life, pain, our unpleasantness, is absolutely inevitable. But suffering, as I say, is optional, okay? That if we fight the pain, in other words, if we pull away, if we dissociate, if we're unwilling to take off the scales and be with what's here, then we suffer. We never discover that beauty and awareness and beingness of what we are. We never let, the body is not a portal. It's, and we don't discover our full aliveness. The equation that a lot of us like sharing is that pain times resistance equals suffering. It's, you know, kind of one of those kind of faux formulas, it's not, you know, great, but it gives you the sense, right, that to the extent that we tense against what's happening, there's more tension. So the opposite of that equation, or the flip of it, is that when there's unpleasantness, or when there's pleasantness, pleasantness time, or unpleasantness times presence equals freedom. No resistance, no scales. <laughs> 